Greetings, fellow football managers, and welcome to the wonderful world of attributes. Something slightly different today. We've been talking about tactics and talking about player roles and all of those things in my last few videos. But to activate all of those tactics, to make them work, to put players in different player roles, you actually need to look at this card. You need to figure out what a player is good at, what they're bad at, and what they can actually do for you on and, to some extent, off the field. First things first, this view doesn't really exist in real life. There are data scientists and things like that who are trying to build a model like this and they're trying to standardize things and develop stats and analysis to try and figure this out. But this is actually a luxury that a lot of real world managers don't really have. So playing attributeless is a great option if you wanna just delve into that level of realism. Not all of us are that masochistic, so we have the advantage of this screen. And by the end of this video, I would like to see at least the newer players being able to look at this screen for any player and then judge within a flash, can I use this guy or not? Can I do what I want to do with this player? My thumbnail asks the question, is this guy good? Looking at him right here, just from this view, you have to say, yes, he is good. In real life, very different story. This is probably the worst transfer in the history of transfers and in the history of history. But we are talking about football manager and he isn't actually as good as this screen suggests. So something you need to know about attributes. There are these visible attributes that you can see. There are also hidden attributes, some of which you can get from things like the personality here. This personality thing is very, very important because it gives you an idea of what a player's hidden attributes are like. Aside from looking at a player's personality, you can send your scouts to watch them or scout player. So you go here, reports, click scout report, or just go down here and say scout player, something like that. You can do it in many different ways. You can scout a guy and then your scouts will start to figure out what his personality is like and they'll tell you a little bit about his hidden attributes as well. What about if it is transfer deadline day and you don't have the benefit of a scout report? You can look at this personality and have a bit of a guess as to what their hidden attributes are gonna be like. So personality, for example, a fairly ambitious, tells me that his highest hidden attribute is probably gonna be ambition. Is ambition good or bad? It's okay. It does mean that the player will have that kind of ambitiousness to improve themselves. They do wanna be the best version of themselves in a playing sense or a on-field success sense or you know a good contract and whatever. So ambition isn't bad in that case it is a good attribute to have if you want the guy to at least fulfill their potential speaking of potential that is another hidden attribute every player has a current ability and a potential ability of 1 to 200 all of the stats that you'll see here and a lot of the hidden attributes range from 1 to 20 20 being more and 1 being minimum this does not mean better or worse there are certain bad quote unquote hidden attributes where 20 is a very bad thing. Now, spoiler alert, I am going to look at the hidden attributes of someone, but maybe not Anthony, because that really would be a spoiler. Let's look at Leo Messi. So I'm gonna search for Messi, gonna go to him, and then I'm gonna use the in-game editor to have a look at his hidden attributes. Before that, his personality is driven, which tends to mean high determination and high ambition. So determination is obviously a visible one, and it is 20 out of 20. If we open him up and have a look at him, his ambition is 18. So 18 is kind of a threshold number in a lot of ways. And when you see that personality driven, you can kind of understand that this is going to be a good player because he will improve to what he's got and determination is a good on-field attribute as well. So he's going to put a lot of work in for you. But if we look at Messi's hidden attributes, just starting at the top here, he has a current ability of 182. His potential ability is 200 out of 200. Leo Messi was the first and I think only 200 player in Football Manager. At one point, he was current ability 200, potential ability 200, back when he was in his pump. As you can see, 182 out of 200 is extremely good, which tells you he is still at a world-class level. In terms of a benchmark, 182 is insane. There's been a lot of huge name players who never get close to 182. They'll be in the 165, 170, 175 area. And these are world-class household names that we're talking about. Leo Messi at age, well, right now it's August 2023. He's age 36 and he's a 182, which tells you that he can still perform at a world-class level. Or at least that's what the game is giving you. Can he actually do the job at a world-class level? There, we look at these attributes that you can see on the screen. Now, the CA, the current ability, 
actually gives you this mix here. Obviously, it doesn't add up perfectly. The left side alone is probably more than 182. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that should be 160 right there. Um, and then the other stuff will add up way more. So it's not that all of this adds up to 182, but there's like a little matrix that kind of gives you a certain current ability, and then you've only got a certain number of stats that you can put in here. Certain things are also worth a lot more, things like acceleration and pace. You can have a player with 20 acceleration, 20 pace, and that eats up most of their current ability. That can happen as well. So having a high current ability is needed to have a high range of stats across the board like this. Potential ability tells you where the player can actually get to. And when you're talking about wonder kids, they have high potential ability. Normally above 160 tends to be a wonder kid. You might say that 160 is nothing much, especially when Leo Messi is 182 and he's playing for Inter Miami. No disrespect to Inter Miami, whoever they are. I am joking, of course, but most of your players on top teams are going to be in that 160 area. You might then have a few star players, you know, your Erling Haaland's, your Jude Bellingham's, who are going to be way higher than that. But if you've got a team that is full of 182 players, you're winning every single competition you look at. 160 players are still really, really, really good. They are top division Champions League level players. So just going back to the hidden attribute thing, again, spoiler alert, we are looking at Messi's hidden attributes. You have things like adaptability, which kind of defines whether the player can move to a new country and start performing immediately. You have, or a staff member as well, your scouts and things like that. If you want your scout to just jump over to, for example, North Africa and start scouting Egypt, and he does not have any previous experience in that region, he will need high adaptability to start performing quickly. Same thing goes with players. Same thing probably goes for you and me. I've lived in six countries, so I'm quite adaptable, let's say. But some people take ages to settle in. They have trouble with the food, the language, all of these things can happen. And Football Manager reflects that really well. Ambition, as we've discussed, drives a player to be the best version of themselves. But they can also kind of want to move on sometimes. When PSG comes calling, that player would probably have their head turned and want to move to a high level. If, obviously, they think the club is of a high level or the team is of a high level, whatever. What is a high level, though? That is this reputation thing. On Messi's sheet here, you can see home reputation, world reputation. So a club like PSG would have extremely high reputation. Clubs like Real Madrid have high reputation. So when it comes to going to a reputable club, these players might have their head turned when they have high ambition. It is possible. Ambition is also good to develop a player, though, because, again, they do want to be good. Loyalty is kind of the opposite in terms of having their head turned. A high loyalty player will probably try and stay with you or stay with the club. Whether they're loyal to the club or the manager themselves really depends. Pressure is the ability to perform under pressure in high profile games, things like that. For a lot of people, especially a lot of YouTubers, professionalism is kind of the holy grail. And to be honest, yeah, it is. It is great because it makes the player perform and behave in as professional a way as possible, which means performing well in training, not missing training sessions. It comes also down to things like, you know, PSG coming in with a contract offer. If the player's main attribute there, the main deciding attribute is professionalism and not something like ambition, there's every chance that the player will go, yeah, you know what, I'm under contract. PSG came in with an offer, nice. But the manager said, no, I'm under contract. I'm happy here. I'm an important part of the team. I'm not bothered. So they won't kick up a fuss and then come to you the next day after you say no to the offer going, Hoy, PSG offered a contract, why aren't you letting me go? Professionalism can help with a lot of those things, obviously loyalty too, but professionalism is huge. The biggest thing with professionalism is obviously the way they train. You can almost guarantee that a player will reach their potential ability, a young player, if they have high professionalism. It generally tends to be something you can spot through personality as well, because if a player has fairly professional, then their professionalism will be in this range, 17-ish, and it might be the highest. Messi has higher things like ambition and pressure, so those might tell in the description a little bit more. But you will see personalities like fairly professional, professional, and model professional. Model professional, I think, is a 20, and it's got a couple of other good things in there. Professional tends to be 18+, plus, and then fairly professional is, I think, a 17. So those are the personalities where you know that, okay, this guy's professional, so if he's a young player, he's going to hit his potential. He's a good bet. Sportsmanship is, you know, the guy won't dive at 15 plus or he'll be less likely to do things like that. Temperament is kind of keeping their cool under pressure. You know, you can't really unsettle the guy that easily if he's got a good temperament or a higher value of temperament. 
Controversy is kind of the opposite. High levels of controversy means they make a fuss in the media and things like that. You can get under the player's skin. In certain ways, temperament tends to be more on the pitch as well. Aside from things like professionalism or ambition in the personality, which is a player development kind of thing, you do need to look for things like consistency and important matches. As you can see, Messi has a consistency of 16, again, that's out of 20, and important matches of 18. These define how often he is going to perform to what you will see here. So are these stats true? That is what consistency and important matches actually defines. Consistency means he's going to be a 20 out of 20 dribbler most of the time because he has consistency of 16. He's going to be a 20 out of 20 dribbler and everything else in the majority, the vast majority, if not all of his important matches because he has an 18 out of 20 in important matches. So a player with high consistency and high important matches you can really count on them to perform day in, day out, and obviously in those big games. If you have the choice between the two of them, you should probably look at your level. What kind of football level are you at? Because if you're, for example, a lower league team or a championship team, and then you have an FA Cup run, and then you play a Premier League team, you go to, for example, a Liverpool or a Manchester City, and you're one league below, that becomes an important match, especially if it's a cup game, right? So you probably want the player to have important matches, not consistency. Whereas if you are, for example, a Manchester City or a Liverpool, most of the games that you play are going to be against, you know, rank and file opposition. You're trying to win games. You're trying to get three points in every single game. That is more of a consistency thing. Although you do want the important matches, guys, to turn up when you're playing those derbies. You're playing the City derby. You're playing against, you know, a title rival. You're playing in the Champions League final. You then want important matches too. But consistency becomes a little bit more important. Ideally, have both. There are a few other things like dirtiness, which is, you know, doing nasty things, making tackles. A player with 20 out of 20 dirtiness is probably going to get sent off quite a lot for making leg-breaking challenges. Injury proneness is the likelihood of getting injured. So Lionel Messi has a 6 out of 20, which means he's quite unlikely to get injured which is great. That's something you want from a top player. There have been top players like, for example, Aryan Robin, who had very high injury proneness. They were good at everything else and they would perform all the time, but then they'd get injured all the time as well because they were 18 out of 20 or whatever on injury proneness. So this is another one to look at because you could have a very consistent, very important player, but if they're a 20 out of 20, they're injured every second game or even every game. That can be really frustrating. And they're just not going to be available to perform, even though they can perform on that stage. One question you might ask is, why do all the personalities look good? Because SI does not give real players bad personality descriptions, things like mercenary or unprofessional, you will only start to see in your new gen players, because new gens can't sue SI. If SI were, for example, going to call Anthony unprofessional or a moron or whatever in his personality description, he would sue SI job done. So for that reason, the worst personality you would get is things like fairly ambitious, where they focus on one sole positive, or you might have something like balanced where everything is four, but it's still balanced. So don't actually be fooled by balance. For example, balance just means that everything is kind of nondescript. So everything could be four rather than everything being 15. So just to reiterate on the hidden attributes, Again, we have things like current ability, which gives the player the ability to have a lot of nice numbers over here. And you have things like consistency and important matches, which define the ability of the player to actually use the attributes, which you see here in those particular games, the frequency of which they will actually perform to this level. Now, what is this level? The question that we were trying to ask in the thumbnail of this video is, is Anthony good? As far as football manager is concerned, he is pretty good. His hidden attributes are not going to be at the level of Messi, obviously. Personality, fairly ambitious, means ambition is the one good thing that he has. Stuff like professionalism and so on will be quite low since the game only tells us about decent ambition. Fairly is actually quite high. It's around 15, I would say. But if Anthony has lower consistency, lower important matches, lower pressure, lower temperament, and all of that, he's not going to use these attributes day in and day out. And that's definitely something we are seeing in real life, given his output. I think he's got a single figure number of goals and assists in 80 something games for Manchester United, who I don't know if they're one of the biggest clubs in the world. They're definitely one of the eight biggest clubs in England, you could say. All right, so we've just done a little bit of time travel and we've shapeshifted Anthony into a much better version. This is Dominic Soboslai. We are also in the future, 30th December of 2024. So this is 
about a year and a half up. Reason is I can actually get some coach reports. Because I told you we can learn a lot more about our players from our coach reports and scout reports and things like that. So let's go up here into reports and then coach reports because the player is at our club. Here we go. You can see that the coaches are highlighting all of these pros. Now I've actually reduced the size of my screen because there's so much detail in this video. There are cons just below this. Things like adaptation. They're also talking about a couple of stats which he doesn't quite have. Things like aerial situations and attacking movements. So nothing too big there. But the pros are really, really good. Now you can see right here. Consistent performer relishes big matches so those two hidden attributes we were talking about earlier we know that this guy's got both of them to a really high level so dom is gonna perform to all of these numbers quite a lot of the time because he's both consistent and is good in important matches let's just go back to the squad let's pick out somebody else let's take somebody like Stefan Bayetic. now this guy personality is fairly determined so that's not terribly good Determination is 15, which is what's giving him the fairly determined. He's not terrible, but obviously his personality needs work. He's been on tutoring or mentoring for me for a while. His development has stalled a little bit because of a couple of injuries in this save, but he is coming along okay. You can see a lot of these stats are in a good place. A lot of the mentals especially are really good for 20 years old. But let's look at his coach report. Here we go. One of the things with Football Manager is there's just going to be so much information thrown at you. So a lot of this stuff is talking about the fact that he's under 21 and therefore registration is really good. He can be freely registered. So you've got four entries about under 21s and all of that kind of thing. But you can see fairly consistent performer. We were talking about the word fairly being pretty good. So I know he is consistent. However, I don't see anything here about big matches. So we might be able to surmise here that he is Probably in the middle because it's not down below in the cons area. It's probably middle of the range when it comes to big matches, but consistency is pretty high. So I am going to get a decent level of performance or at least the level of performance that this stat sheet tells me. And he's progressing. He's okay. He's got 14s everywhere, which is pretty decent. Another question though is, what is a 14? Is 14 good or not? Before I answer that question, we need to talk about natural fitness. Stefan Bayetic has a natural fitness of 11 which is not very good. Obviously, attributes are between 1 and 20. 11 is very middle of the road. But if we look at players like Lionel Messi, let's try and find him. Messi has natural fitness of 14. So Messi is 37 right now in this game state. His natural fitness is 14. And you can see that a lot of his attributes are in a very good state. Mental attributes don't really decay with age. Technicals also don't decay that much with age. It's normally the physicals which decay. And obviously, Messi isn't super fast anymore. He's not that agile. Not very, very good when it comes to acceleration. Then again, 13, 14, 17. These are comparable to that Anthony guy we were looking at before. And natural fitness 14 is giving Messi the ability to actually stay in this kind of condition at age 37. Bayetic with a natural fitness of 11, that tells me that he might not be as useful at that kind of age. So this natural fitness score, if it's really low, if it's something like three, four, five, something like that, you might see a player really decay a lot once he hits 30, 31, 32, they'll start to fall off a cliff. Whereas a player who has natural fitness 14, 15, 16, 17, James Milner level 18, 19, 20, they're going to be good to go until sort of 37, 38. Zlatan Ibrahimovic had fantastic natural fitness. He played until he was 40 and I think only just retired. And not just play, but play to a really high level as well to kind of maintain their current ability at that state where they can actually play for top teams if they are at a world-class level to begin with. You can have plenty of players at the sort of 140 current ability level, which is still great, and they can maintain themselves and be a good top division player for the entirety of their career, kind of like James Milner. So now that we've looked at natural fitness and we've identified the fact that it kind of defines a player's career length, by the way, it also defines how quickly a player can recover after a game. So if you've got games every three days in December in the Premier League, for example, your high natural fitness players will be up for it most of the time, but you might have to rest the players with lower natural fitness, just on the basis that they take longer to recover. All other things considered equal. 
Okay, so I said Stefan Bajetic being 14 and 15 everywhere makes him really good and quite serviceable at the Premier League level, even for a side like Liverpool. I stand by that because of a concept that I personally call benchmarking. I like to benchmark attributes. And I think it's fairly logical because if you look at a 20 out of 20, again, if we go to old Messi over here, we have lots of 20s on his sheet. Technique is 20, flair is 20, determination 20, vision 20, oh my good lord. Let's look at De Bruyne, for example. KDB has a 20 vision. So Messi had four 20s, KDB has one 20. Essentially, we're talking about the top of the top, the cream of the crop, the best player in the world with that attribute is going to be a 20. So Kevin De Bruyne's vision, Lionel Messi's vision is a 20. Let's look at Mr. Mbappe. He's got acceleration of 20, pace of 20. So his speed is essentially the best in the world, according to Football Manager. His dribbling is 19, so it's kind of almost there. But basically, they're telling you Mbappe is the fastest player in the world. Let's think about some other stats. So a guy like Osiman, who is in my team, I don't know why I'm searching for him. He has a off-the-ball skill of 20. So he's going to be the best in the world at off-the-ball. He's fantastic in other areas. He's got 19 pace, which is great. But in terms of being the best in the world, is off-the-ball. Am I trying to criticize 19 and 18s? Absolutely not. For me, 18 is that threshold figure. I mentioned it before that 18 is a bit of a threshold number in Football Manager. For me, 18 is world-class. One of the best in the world at this skill or, you know, really world-class level is 18. So Osman, as you can see, his finishing, heading, off the ball, pace, and his jumping, agility, and acceleration are kind of almost there. So this combination of attributes, this kind of ecosystem of attributes, makes him an absolutely elite striker. Yes, his decision-making, his anticipation, his composure could be a little bit better, but that said, 13, 15, 15 is really good too. That is also top level. That is another benchmark that we'll be looking at in a second. But obviously, if this guy's doing a job of being a striker, an advanced striker running in behind and stuff like that, having these particular skills off the ball, finishing pace at that level means he can do the job amazingly well. So this is going to be an elite player. If he had one passing, one vision, one tackling, one long throws, one marking, one free kick taking, one corners, one crossing, even one dribbling, one bravery, you can put all of those things down to one, bring his current ability down to 140, 130, he would still do an amazing job as a finisher, as an advance forward or a poacher because of his 18 finishing, 18 heading, 18 jumping, 17 acceleration, 20 off the ball, still has his 15 composure, 15 anticipation. So you can kind of see that a player doesn't have to be 20 in everything to do a great job. Obviously, a guy like Erling Haaland is also going to do a fantastic job when you look like this. This is basically 20s in everything. Okay, I'm kidding. It is 18s in everything. But look at that. Jumping is 18. Pace is 19, just like Osman. In fact, speed-wise, he's basically the same profile as Osman, but he's also strong and he's got all of those other things as well. So Haaland can do a world-class job, basically whatever you ask him to do. Okay, so a benchmark doesn't just mean world-class. What about just for a top-level player? As we cycle through some of the best names in the world, let's just go back to Stefan Bajetic, who is more 14s and 13s and 15s than 17s, 18s, 19s and 20s. Can he do a job? Absolutely. Because for me, around 14 or 15 is a benchmark level for a top league, something like the you know top five leagues, your French league if you want to compete with PSG, your English Premier League if you want to challenge for the title. If you want to do these things, you kind of need something like a 14. And then I work downwards from there. So if I'm looking for a Premier League defensive midfielder as Bayetic is, I would be looking for things like tackling, things like marking, a little bit of first touch and passing so that he can play the ball. All of these stats are 14s and 13s. His technique is 14 as well, which will help him execute some of those things. Fine. He looks good. He looks serviceable. He's not going to be a world-class defensive midfielder right now. He's not Rodri, but he can do a job. Can he come in there and score lots of goals? Finishing five, long shot seven. No, that does not meet my benchmark of 14. Can he do that occasionally? Yeah, absolutely. But is this the new Steven Gerrard? According to Football Manager, it is not. Unless you train him and you specifically focus on getting those attributes up, you probably can as a 20-year-old player. 
he probably has a lot more potential ability to find. He's not there yet with his current ability, so you might be able to train him, but then again, that's not his skill set. His skill set is those things and then those mentals. Look at these mentals. Composure 15, concentration 15, determination 15, teamwork 15. So he's absolutely going to do a good job in that defensive midfield area. He has the mentality for it. He also has things like acceleration agility, very decent jumping reach of 12 for a DM. I wouldn't play him at center back because he's below my 14 threshold, but as a DM, jumping of 12 is probably a, a little bit above average. You do have a lot of short DMs, so 12 jumping will win a lot of headers against other midfielders who are not always the tallest players in the world. You've got a lot of short midfielders, short attacking midfielders, so you can beat a lot of those players in the air. So if I look at my squad and you can see, again, this is a couple of years in or a year and a half in, so I've had some time to rejig my squad. If I look at my players, Scalvini is somebody I brought in basically as a replacement for Van Dijk, so I'm not really looking at him as DM, but you can see I haven't really changed DM at Liverpool very much. I've still got Endo and Bayetic, who you start the game with if you're playing on real world and you allow the Endo transfer to come through. I've also got guys like Gravenberg. I've got yeah, I haven't really changed anything at DM. So that should tell you that I'm actually happy with Bayetic as one of my DM options. Am I using Alexis McAllister at DM? No, I'm using him as an attacking central midfielder. Am I using Trent at DM? No, I'm using him at right back as a complete wing back on support for the most part. So Endo is my other DM. Let me just open him up like this so you can see all of his stats. His mentals kind of stand out. He's got that world-class level when it comes to determination, teamwork, uh, he's got very, very good levels when it comes to things like work rate, concentration, bravery, all very vital for a DM. His stamina and fitness are really high too, which is crucial, especially given he's 31 years old. So if his natural fitness was not 17, if it was something like three, he would have started dropping off a cliff. But as you can see, his attributes are very much in the area that he started with. He's also improved a tiny little bit as well. You can see some of these arrows are hopping up a little bit. So in terms of DM, tackling is 15, as I mentioned before with Bayetic. Passing 13, marking 13, first touch 13. His heading's 15, jumping reaches 12. So he can do a job in the air as well. He's got a little bit of vision, not too much, but 13 again is fine. So he's got all of these things at the benchmark level I was talking about. Agility is a bit low, acceleration's a bit low, anticipation's a bit low, but c'est la vie. Point is, my benchmark of 14, I'm hitting it. DM is just a DM for me. I'm not trying to do a register right now with the current tactic. So I'm absolutely fine with having Endo and Bayetic as my two DMs. And I'm winning the league. I'm probably on course to win the Champions League in the season and the league again. So this 14 benchmark, I think, will hold. As you go down the leagues, you can kind of drop the benchmark a little bit. So if you're moving to a weaker league than the Premier League, pull it down to 13, pull it down to 12. For me, going down to kind of League 1, you're looking at an 11. League 2 also is about an 11. If you want to win that league, you want players with 11 or 12 in their stats. Anything more than that, for me, is an outlier. So let's just jump across to those leagues. So this is Darlington in the Vanarama North. A lot of you know that I've managed them before. This squad looks very different to what I had. So looking at guys like Ben Little, you've got a lot of 10s around there, a few 11s, a few 12s. So for me, a benchmark at this level would be something like a 10, maybe a 9 even. For me, a 9 can actually do a job. So when I look at Ben Little, he's got a lot of stats above that 9 level. He's got a lot of stats at the 9 level. So he can absolutely do any kind of job that I ask him to, as long as it doesn't require something like a six. So can he play as a striker or a shadow striker? I don't think so, because six is a lot less than nine. But can he come off the wing? Can he play as a winger? Dribbling nine, crossing eight? Yeah, sure. Inverted winger? Yeah, absolutely. As long as I don't put him as an inverted forward or a shadow striker, I think he can be really good. But how do I get the most out of him? It's probably with this 11 passing, given that 11 is a lot more than nine. You've got things like work rate and stuff, which is at 12. So he can do a job in those situations. If I focus on making him something like a playmaker or just a box-to-box -box midfielder or something like that, long shots is 10. So at this level, he's decent with his long shots. If I look through the squad a little bit here, we've got Danny Benson on loan. Look at that. There's a 16 on the pitch. There's a 14 for decisions. So this guy would be a very intelligent player. He's also extremely good when it comes to jumping, natural fitness, acceleration. So this guy's a fast center back at this level. Look at the heading, marking, tackling. That's all at that nine level. So again, the benchmark at this area, Van Rama North, Van Rama National probably, is around a nine or a 10. If you have things like five and four and even seven, that's a little bit low for the player. And things like 12 and 
you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, those are extremely high for this level. So those are probably things you can capitalize on by saying, okay, that guy's way above the benchmark. Let's use that. And I've talked through some of that with my Darlington team before with guys like Tom Platt, who are jumping 13, finishing 10, which was way above average. And therefore I was trying to get him into the box to use those attributes. Okay, we're back to Liverpool now. And I know this has been a very, very long video, but it's going to get even longer. I want to run through a bunch of the attributes. I'll go into them in more detail in a future video. If you're interested, drop a comment and let me know if you want me to discuss, you know, which attribute mix should you have for which role? I'd love to do something like that. But let's just run through all of these attributes. We've talked about natural fitness. Now, pace is very simple. It's how fast a player is. If you hover over, you can get a little tooltip over here. So do that. Read what SI tells you. Basically, it's the top speed on the ball as well as off the ball. Now, can a player run at 15? Can Alexander Arnold maintain his 15 pace when he's on the ball? That depends on his dribbling stat because this says player's ability to run with the ball and manipulate it under close control. The problem here is a lot of these attributes work in tandem with each other. They're not in isolation. So is this guy going to be amazing running down the wing with the ball? It's not just his pace. You need to consider, for example, his dribbling as well. Acceleration is a lot simpler. This is about how fast the player can get to a top speed from their standing start. Is pace and acceleration super important? Yeah, a lot of the time it is because you want to be first to the ball, whether it's down the wing, in the middle, whatever it is. Can you get away without pace and acceleration? Absolutely. If you just pull up, you know, Xavi, Iniesta, those kinds of guys. Okay, Iniesta was fairly fast. But Xavi especially was a little bit slow, but he didn't need much pace. He was kind of sitting in the middle of the park and dictating play like that. Zeeland in one of his videos mentioned that he was signing Luka Modric, for example, before retiring. The guy can't run, but he can stand in the middle of the pitch and play passes. Let's try and have a look at Modric. This is Luka Modric right now. Can he run? Absolutely not. Does he have natural fitness? Yes, he does. What he has is agility and balance. Now, agility and balance are key stats for a lot of central midfielders. So again, looking at Xavi back in the day, Agility and balance is what he had. Luka Modric has agility and balance. I'm sure Tony Kroos has them as well. Let's see. Okay, not so much agility, but he does have a little bit of balance. So you can see that agility and balance tend to be more midfield attributes. And I think looking at Kroos and Modric play, you can see they're both very balanced on the ball. But agility-wise, Modric is a lot better. He can move, he can stop, he can start, he can change direction. That is very crucial in a central midfield player. Even if you don't have acceleration and pace, that's fine try and have agility and balance because a midfield player basically needs to be on his feet. He can then execute a pass quickly if he has good balance rather than just falling over when he gets challenged. And agility means a quick little turn into space. All they need is that half yard of space and then they play the pass. So agility and balance are a very good combination for that kind of thing. You will really see balance come to the fore in the match engine as well. When you have players going in for a tackle, the ball, you know, rolls free. The first guy to actually get to the ball could be the guy with more balance because he doesn't go down in the challenge. Something like balance has a big role to play there. So if you want a player to kind of be first to the ball, to be dribbling really well, stuff like that, you want acceleration, pace, agility, balance in a mix. Low balance means the guy just falls over when he tries to do something. If you look at those videos on YouTube with, you know, stupidest moments of 2023, stuff like this, it's all about players falling over their own feet. And that is a lack of balance. Do you want that from your players? No. Have high balance. Do you want your players to be able to change direction quickly, run with the ball a lot, pace, agility? Do you want your winger on support to just beat a man over a space of kind of two yards and then whip across in? Acceleration and agility. So if we look at Ben Doak, for example, Ben Doak is a classic winger. He's got acceleration, agility, balance. All of that is 15 and above. Pace is not so high, so he's not super fast. So his best role for me is winger support. And lo and behold, if you look at the bottom left, the game tells me his best role is winger support as well, because he's got that classic, I will beat you over two yards and whip across in. And that's what he does in the match engine as well, if you give him that kind of role. Okay, stamina is kind of obvious. It's how long the player can run. Can they go up and down the flank, the whole game, things like that. Stamina is important too for midfielders, fullbacks, things like that. A striker, maybe an attacking inside forward or something can get away with low stamina. Trequatista, Ongonj, those guys can get away with it. Central defenders to some extent as well. But stamina is a key attribute. Fitness helps with stamina. Jumping is a big one as well. This is a very misunderstood attribute a lot of the time. I see a lot of YouTubers, or not a lot, a few YouTubers, focusing a lot on height. It's like, oh, I need a big boy to win headers. No, you don't. 
You need a guy with high jumping. It doesn't matter if he's five foot seven. Hello, Fabio Cannavaro. Five foot seven, but he had everything else. He could actually jump. He could get off the ground, which is better than a guy who's tall, six foot two, but can't get off the ground. Back in the day, football manager used to actually combine these two things. You'd have height as a baseline and then have a jumping reach. And the two were added somehow to give your ability to rise up into the air and win a header. But now it is no more. It is just jumping that you need to worry about. So don't worry if he's tall, if he's short, if he's heavy, if he's light. Does not matter at all. It's just how he looks in the match engine. What you need to worry about, number one thing, is jumping. Obviously, jumping, again, does not work in a vacuum. You have things like strength. So once you get in the right position to be able to stay in that position, bully another player, get above a player, things like that. Strength comes in. Bravery comes in. Even things like off the ball might be able to come in there. Things like decisions, do you even jump for the ball or not? Aggression, are you aggressive enough to get up to fight for the for the header? Those things all play a role in does this player win a header or not? So you do need to look at things like that. You need to look at the ecosystem, not just the one single stat. So strength, as we said, is a supporting attribute for things like jumping, but also things like winning 50-50 challenges, keeping balanced in a tackle, things like that. Your strength helps too. Winning a 50-50, shouldering a player off the ball is a big one. You see that animation in the match engine quite a lot. Moving over to the technical side of things, let's stay with Ben Doak a little bit because his technical attributes are really interesting. You can see that he has long throws of three, heading of five, but he's got technique of 14, which is pretty good, dribbling of 15. So that 14 technique, he'll look really good and he'll perform really well at those things which he's good at. So for example, he's a very good technical dribbler. He's a pretty decent technical crosser. He's got good technical first touch and passing, but his tackling technique may not be great. Even though he has technique of 14, it doesn't mean that his tackling will be amazing from an eight. It just means that he's an average tackler. His technique might be decent, but he's not that good at it. So a lot of the time, you should probably look at technique alongside the stats that the player is good at. So if the guy has technique 14 and tackling 14, then he's a good technical tackler. If we look at, for example, Virgil van Dijk, we have technique 16, tackling 17, passing 16. So he will execute all of those moves really well, things like tackles, things like passes. His technique is good with those things. His first touch is amazing, 17. So can you press, can you win the ball off Virgil van Dijk when he's taking that first touch? Probably not. Is he gonna give that many fouls away when he's tackling? Probably not as many as a guy who has tackling 17, but technique of five. What's interesting with technique as well is that you can kind of see it in the match engine and the game tells you that it reflects the aesthetic quality as well, the refinement. And that's actually visible in the match engine, which is cool. We were talking about benchmarks. When you have a player who's way higher than the benchmark, for example, Virgil van Dijk, with his technique of 16 and his passing of 16, he's above any kind of benchmark, really. You can kind of see how good he is from the match engine, from his animations, compared to the guy playing next to him, for example. Okay, just running up the technicals really quickly because they don't really have as much nuance as some of the physical attributes. Penalty taking is the technical striking of the ball from the penalty spot. If they have low finishing and low composure, they might not be a great penalty taker because of that composure failure. But technical penalty taking, striking the ball well, cleanly, that's a big part of it too. You need to practice penalties, not just to get your head in the game, but to actually get the technical aspect of it right too. Passing is the passing range, percentage of success on making the pass. This one does have a little bit of nuance because it plays with vision. If you have vision of like two, but passing of 16, you can make every pass you look at. The problem is you're not actually gonna see those attacking passes, those through balls, those killer passes. You won't actually see them. So vision is kind of important there. It's interesting that you might have a player who works kind of the other way. If we look at our squad once more, I've got an example of that. Mr. Darwin Nunez, one of my favorite, favorite players. I think this guy's a monster. And what you're looking at here is really Darwin Nunez from last year, not from this year. He's gonna get a huge stats bump probably in February, definitely in Football Manager 2025, because he's such a beast of a player. I know he's a bit of a punchline sometimes, but the guy has a fantastic goals and assists tally. He's Liverpool's most creative player at the moment. He has vision of 14. I think this is gonna be bumped up to about 16 in the next uh, data update but his passing is 11. That will also get a bump because he's actually registering tons of assists, but it's probably not gonna get a huge bump because his technical passing isn't so good. He overhits passes, he underhits passes sometimes, but he can actually see them. So he sees them, but he doesn't always execute them because of the passing stat being below benchmark. 
Okay, going up to marking, this is the ability to, you know, just mark a player to stick tight to them to be able to get tight enough to win a tackle in a defensive situation. Obviously a key stat for defenders. Long throws is the player's ability to throw the ball long. So you're looking at somebody with a long throw stat of 15 or more if you want to really execute long throws from your set pieces. If you have a guy with long throws of 11 or 12 and you're trying to tell him throw the ball super long, he's not going to be Rory Delap. If he's an 18 or so, somebody like, I think, a Joe Gomez, if we look for him, Joe Gomez, long throw 16. So he can actually chuck the ball pretty long, not all the way to the goalkeeper like an 18 would be able to, but 16 still gets him a good long throw range. Long shots is long shots. It's shots from kind of outside the penalty area. From inside the penalty area, it tends to be finishing. So that's kind of the difference there. Finishing is the ability to finish a chance and a long shot can sometimes be a chance. So both of those attributes kind of need to work hand in hand. Obviously, if you've got a player with low long shots and high finishing, you probably want to get them into the box somehow. You know, a central midfielder attack versus a central midfielder support would be a big decision. If it goes the other way, so the finishing is low, you probably want him outside of the box. So again, I have an example of that. Let's look at Soboslai. Finishing of 12, long shots of 16. So obviously I don't really want him getting into the box. Finishing 12 isn't bad. In fact, it's pretty good. But I do want him using the 16 long shots rather than the 12 finishing, if I'm given a choice. So I generally have him on a support duty as a central midfielder for that reason. Okay, heading is the ability to head the ball. So putting a header on target or clearing a, a header into kind of where you need to clear it to. So not straight back to the opposition, but you know, wide and long into the flanks. That would be heading, putting a header on target from being inside the box, getting power on it, placement on it. All of that falls into heading. Obviously, if you have really high heading, but no jumping, no strength, no bravery, going to be kind of useless unless you're completely unmarked on a header and you don't have to jump for it. If it's a standing header, sure, it's going to work. But generally, I would take a low heading, but high jumping, high bravery, high anticipation. All of that gives a guy a good chance of scoring headers. Because sometimes a header, especially at the back post, it's kind of going into an open net. So you don't need super high skill. So one tip for you there is to have a winger with decent jumping and stuff, because they might be able to out jump their fullback and then score a header. Even if they have low heading like a seven or an eight, they might still be able to get above their fullback and then it's a fairly easy header at the far post. So do I want high heading skill? Well, not really, just center backs and strikers normally. With others, I don't really care too much about the heading stat. Free kick taking stat, you probably want a couple of guys who are good at this on your team. It's the ability to actually put the ball into the back of the net or to put it on a plate from a, you know, a setup free kick. Are you going to score tons and tons of free kicks in a season? Not really. I'm not sure if the tuning on free kicks is right in Football Manager 24. But then again, if you look at real life statistics, you're not scoring that many free kicks as well. Trent Alexander-Arnold, I would say, is one of the best, if not the best. I guess he's the third best, maybe, or the second best free kick taker in the Premier League. And he's only scored, what, one? And he did have an own goal, kind of go off the bar and off the keeper and then in. So one or two, something like this. So you're not getting that many free kicks every season. So it's not one that I value too much. First touch is one, however, that I value a lot. It's the player's ability to control the ball. A player with a poor first touch can be a huge liability because they can be pressed very quickly by the opposition and you can turn over the ball like that. So high first touch in almost every position is kind of vital. Dribbling is the ability of a player to actually run with the ball and control it. So a player with really low dribbling will not actually be able to keep close control. They might just punt it 10 yards and then try and run behind it. And therefore you need to be very careful, especially in these positions of AML, AMR, those wide positions, you want to be careful that you're not giving the player the wrong role. Now, Dominic Soboslai, he's got that benchmark of 14. See, so he can absolutely do the job, even though it's not one of his best skills. But I want to show you a different player. This is Jarel Kwanza. Again, I think a player who will get a massive bump in the next data update, whenever that is. But look at his dribbling stat. It's just 8. His crossing stat is 4. Those are way below the benchmark of 14. And again, if we look at his other stats, you know, in key areas for a center back, things like heading, marking, tackling, technique, first touch is there at 12, all the mentals are 12 and above, you have jumping of 15, so this guy's meeting all of the thresholds for being a center back, but the moment I put him at right back, look at that, he is competent at right back positionally, but he doesn't have the ability to play as a wing back or something, because he doesn't have the dribbling, and he definitely doesn't have the crossing ability to be able to pull that role off, so he might, when you ask him to run with the ball like a wing back, 
he might just punt the ball and then try and charge after it. And his agility of 10, so he can't really change direction, acceleration of 13 and pace of 13 is not outstanding for a wingback. So he will struggle a lot if you ask him to try and play as a wingback. Whereas for a center back, he's absolutely fine. He has everything in place. Corner kick taking, meanwhile, is just the ability to take a corner properly to put the ball exactly where you ask him to put the ball. Here we go. Trent has 14 on corners, which isn't super high, but he's got crossing on 17, technique on 17, which will actually back up that 14 corners, making him a pretty good corner taker because he has everything in place. So corners of 14 is not exceptionally high, but it does hit that benchmark level of 14 that we were looking at. So he will absolutely do a job. Can he take free kicks? Yeah, he's on 14 as well. He can do a job. Okay, let's finish up with a run through the mental stats. Aggression is the ability to actually get stuck in and go into a tackle. So this is a really important attribute when it comes to pressing systems. If you try and play a pressing system without players who have decent aggression, I don't mean that you have to have 19 aggression on every player, but decent aggression of something like 12, like Trent or 14, again, looking at our benchmark, you want that kind of aggression to have a pressing system going. Otherwise, the players aren't going to be decisive on the press. They're just not going to be willing to go in for those tackles. And then your pressing will fall down just because the players can't pull it off. Bravery is a very adjacent stat to that. So they need to be brave as well. Going into a 50-50 tackle. I don't know if you've seen those 50-50 tackles in the Premier League or any top league, to be honest. They are absolutely brutal. Just mistiming it or just moving the foot into a bad position can be a leg-breaking tackle. So players have to be so brave to go into those 50-50 challenges, for example, and your bravery stat tells you whether a player will do that or not. Trent isn't super brave for this level. Again, we're looking at 14. Somebody like Mo Salah, I think, is also not really brave. And you can see that when they play in real life as well. Those stats have been assigned really well, I think. If we look at Mo Salah, yep, his bravery is 10. His aggression is 11. So he's not very high on those. So can he press? Yeah, he can do a decent job at pressing. Does Salah press well for me? Yes, because he has things like anticipation. So he can actually read the game. He's got good work rate and teamwork. So he will try his best and he does win the ball quite a lot. So even though he isn't a 14 or more at aggression and bravery, he can still do a job in a pressing system because he has other stuff going for him. His pace is also really high, so he can actually get to the ball very, very quickly when a player makes a mistake. However, I do need to mention a player with low bravery, I guess Salah would be low because he's not up to 14. You can hard tackle them. In terms of opposition instructions, I think this is one of the first things I've ever said about opposition instructions on this channel. If you have an opposition player with low bravery, 10 or below, and you're playing at a level like a Premier League with a benchmark of 14 plus, that guy would then have low bravery. You can hard tackle them because they won't be willing to go into a tackle. What you're doing with hard tackling is you're not trying to knock them out. You are actually just trying to tackle them more. You're triggering more tackles. And a player with low bravery is not willing to go into a tackle as much. So you're increasing your chances of winning the ball off of that player, if you see what I mean. Okay, composure is the ability of a player to kind of keep their head in various situations when they're being pressed, for example. Can they still make a good decision? That's composure. If they're in front of the penalty spot, can they actually keep their head? If we look at concentration, this is a really big one, actually, because it allows your player to stay switched on throughout the game. And therefore, they will react very quickly to all situations. Players with low concentration can actually miss out on reacting to something. They can be a step off the game. I've actually seen this in real life in Joe Gomez a couple of times, where he's just been one step off. And that doesn't sound like much, but in a top-level, elite-level football game, even missing one step can be huge. I'm not criticizing Joe Gomez. I think he's absolutely fantastic. But I have seen that split-second lack of concentration, and it is visible because all of the other players are moving in unison. Decision-making is a huge attribute. This kind of defines a player's match intelligence. Obviously, some of the other mental attributes help with that. Things like anticipation is a very much a match intelligence kind of thing. But decision-making is the player's ability to make a decision. So this applies every minute of the game. It applies on, do I go in for that tackle? Do I make this pass? Which of these two passes do I make? Should I mark that guy? Should I let him go? Should I chase this ball? Should I wait? All of those things. Should I shoot? Should I just play for possession? All of those things are decision-based. And obviously, the more, the better, because then they can make the right decision given the context of the moment. Huge stat. For basically any player obviously you want players who are on the ball a bit more like pass masters playmakers midfielders creative players especially you want them to have high decision making 
But to be honest, I don't compromise on decisions if I'm managing a football team. Determination is a huge one. It gets a lot of flack from a lot of creators sometimes, but you actually need this a lot because your player can be determined to do something, chasing a ball, even just dribbling past a player, trying to win something, trying to win a, a battle of 50-50, push somebody else off the ball. Determination helps a lot. A low determination player may not actually see the amount of success in situations as a high determination player. So don't sleep on this one as well. Flair is interesting. It's the player's ability to do something unexpected. So this one really supports things like dribbling a lot because if you have high dribbling and low flair, like a real life Anthony, you know what he's going to do. He's going to try and get on his left foot, move inside and try to score a goal. A lot of players out there do that. They have the same move like I and Robin, but there was so much flair going on. With Robin, he could kind of fake so quickly and then move the ball a tiny bit more and then fake again. So you never knew when he was going to pull the trigger. And he would go all the way from the right half space all the way to the far post across the goal just faking shots, faking shots, faking shots, and then finally pull the trigger. And then where does he shoot? Does he shoot near post? Does he shoot back across goal? So even though a move might be predictable, you always knew what Robin wanted to do. He might still have lots of flair and be very difficult to play against. Whereas Anthony is super easy to play against in real life because he has zero flair. On Football Manager, he has lots of flair. So again, ratings is a bit messed up sometimes. People normally rate for the last season. So when you're playing... FM24, especially at the start of the game, you are playing basically the players from last year, the ratings for last year, which is why Manchester United is so good in FM24. It's because they're looking at Manchester United from 2022-2023, and that's how the ratings have been done. Okay, leadership is again just leadership. You want a captain to have leadership. It allows a player to influence the others and kind of drag them along with you. Players with high leadership can come up good in crucial moments as well. You will see that quite a lot kind of that captain's performance or that captain's goal or something like this. You do actually see that. So influence, it used to be called influence. Leadership now is a pretty big stat. Off the ball is the ability to kind of move around, receive a pass. So you want this from guys like Osiman, who is your poacher or advance forward or something like this. You want good off the ball movement, especially in that final third or in the box. Very, very key. But it's also key for central midfielders. I know T4IRL did a great video on Scott McTominay when he was playing as a defensive midfielder on how his off-the-ball movement was really poor. He wasn't showing for a pass. However, now that he's playing as an attacking central midfielder, his off-the-ball movement seems pretty good. So that's a bit of a conundrum because I don't think you can really reflect that in Football Manager besides saying that his ability at CDM is low or just orange or something and not bright green. But hey, positioning is kind of the reverse of it. It's the defensive positioning. So can a player kind of block off the passing lanes and things like that when it's a defensive situation? SI is very clear in saying this is not used in attacking situations. So it's not how good your target man positions themselves for a cross. That's off the ball. It is all about the defensive situations. It may be important on your attacking players when it comes to a pressing setup, counter-pressing, cutting out the passing lanes. That's something that Mo Salah, for example, does really well in real life. And you can kind of see the way he does it with a positioning of nine, which is good for an attacker, but he does it way better than a positioning two or three attacker. Teamwork is another big one. It is about the tactical instructions while also working for the teammates. So you have two aspects there, which is pretty good. Low teamwork player will not do what you tell him sometimes. He would rather go for his player traits. And if a player trait contrasts with the tactical instruction, you want high teamwork so that your orders will overwrite what the player wants to do if they are in opposition. Players will, however, love it when you give them tactical instructions that work with. So, for example, Mo Salah has a trait cut inside from right wing. That works, obviously, with an inside forward or an inverted winger. However, with Teamwork 16, I can tell him to play as a winger support or a winger attack on that right flank. That is okay. He'll still do his player trade thing, but for the most part, with the Teamwork of 16, he will do a standard winger thing as well. Okay, vision we talked about before. It is the ability to basically see a pass. So a player with high vision is going to be that playmaker kind of profile. So Mo Salah can do that really well with a 17 vision and he can execute it with a 15 passing. Again, if you have somebody like Nunez with 14 vision, he does see the pass, but then with 12 passing or 11 passing, he might not always be able to play the pass. There's a big thing there and these two attributes especially need to work in concert with each other. Finally, work rate is the player's willingness to move around, charge, win tackles, press, 
do all of those things. So high work rate player will be constantly on the move working for your team, especially if they've got teamwork as well. And that's supported by fitness and stamina. You kind of want all of those together. And then you have a player who will work and work and work, kind of like that James Milner profile, as opposed to a lazy player kind of profile. When I say lazy player, I don't want to single out Messi, but if you watch him play, he's that classic trequartista at the moment where he's just walking around the field, which is fine. It brings a lot of benefits, but he's not really going to contribute to your pressing structure and things like that. A guy with high teamwork, high work rate, high stamina, high fitness will contribute to that kind of system. Okay, this has been exceptionally long. And if you've got anything to add, I would absolutely love it if you throw it in the comments below. Just to reiterate, I think your hidden attributes will activate what you see here, the visible attributes. So Mo Salah looks fantastic. He's got so many good numbers over here. But if his hidden attributes were really low, like consistency, like important matches, if those two were really low, all of these numbers would count for squat. And I would rather have a player who's 14 in everything, but consistency and important matches were a lot higher. If we look at our coach reports or scout reports, we can find out what those things are. As you can see here, he is a consistent performer and he relishes big matches. So Salah now, I know, is going to be able to actually execute all of the stats that you see on this stat sheet to a very high level the majority of the time because he is both consistent and good in important matches. If you don't have the time to get a coach report or a scout report, remember the personality. Salah, for example, is professional, so his professionalism is really high. It means that he's going to do a job, he's going to train well, he's going to keep himself in good condition, so that is really good. It's even more vital for younger players because you'll know that they will develop. That's a reason why I brought this guy in, Lucas Bergvall. He doesn't seem like a superstar, but he's got pretty good potential. He's also a model citizen, which means all of his attributes are at a good level, which is great. I know he will develop. I know he'll be a pretty low-stress player because of model citizen. Therefore, controversy and stuff is low. Professionalism and stuff is high. So even though I'm hardly playing him, you can't see it, but I've only given him about five games so far in this season, and we're in December. It's not been the most productive loan for him. He hasn't played super amount, but he is developing because his attitude is fantastic. I think I've done a fairly decent job of giving you a brief idea of the different stats, but also the fact that you need accompanying stats or supporting stats. For example, dribbling needs things like acceleration, agility, things like flair. Can Robertson beat a man with dribbling 11, even though he's in the Premier League? He's got dribbling 11 and flair 11, which are below benchmark. That said, he's got acceleration 16, pace 16, agility balance is 14, 14, which is decent. So you can just boot the ball past somebody and beat them in a foot race. So yes, he can actually dribble. So sometimes being below benchmark is okay if you've got some other attributes to make up for it. Otherwise, try and develop a benchmarking system for yourself in terms of where you want your team to get to. And that'll make things like recruitment or picking players for your team, picking roles for players a lot easier. So thank you very much. Please drop any extra info in the comments. I'd love to engage with you as always down there. Thank you so much if you got to the end of this marathon. I hope it's given you some value. Cheers.